Good morning, folks. Uh, welcome to the DBHR monthly housing topical webinar. Today, uh, we'll be talking about health homes, and uh, I hope you enjoy the webinar. We'll get started in about four more minutes here. Good morning and welcome to the DBHR monthly housing topical webinar. If um, you've dialed in and added your audio code, you can hear and speak. Um, sometimes when we unmute you, uh, folks will be muted for the presentation and we'll take questions afterwards, either. Uh, by audio or you can type in the question pane or the chat. All right, folks, it's 8.30. We're going to get started. Um, I'd like to introduce Nicole Dronen and Brendy Visentainer from the Aging Long-Term Services Administration. All right, good morning. As, um, as Wanda said, my name is Nicole Dronen. I am the Health Home Program Manager here at ALTSA, the Washington State Department of Health. Um, I do have Brandy Byzantainer with me also. She is the Health Home Training Program Manager. And today we're gonna talk with you about the Health Home Program. Um, we really appreciate you taking the time this morning, um, bright and early, to learn more about the Health Home Program. 
So the Health Home Program in Washington State is a partnership operated by two different state agencies, the Health Care Authority and then also the Department of Health. Together, we um, provide a good balance of medical and social perspectives for the overall Health Home Program. At the end of the slides, we'll have our contact information if you would like to get hold of us. Next slide. So we'd like to start off with a quote. Um, this was used with permission that speaks to the reality um, of experiences and the heart of what the Health Home Program is about. Dr. Gottlieb from the University of California in San Francisco once said, I diagnosed abdominal pain when the real problem was hunger. I confused social issues with medical problems and other clients too. I mislabeled the hopelessness of long-term unemployment as depression and the poverty that causes clients to miss pills or appointments as non-compliance. In one older client, I mistook the inability to read for dementia. My medical training had not prepared me for this ambush of social circumstance. Real life obstacles had an enormous impact on my clients' lives, but because I had neither the skills nor the resources for treating them, I ignored the social context of the disease together. altogether. Next slide. So what is the Health Home Program? Um, the Health Home Program is designed to be a person-centered, focused on improving health by providing the tools and supports to empower clients and their families. As a result, clients have a better understanding of how to address their health care needs, and which in turn helps reduce avoidable health care costs. The Health Home Care Coordination is not only medical-based. It reaches across all service providers, including specialty care, behavioral health, and long-term services and supports. The Health Home Program also ensures care transitions are better, care, are better coordinated, so they don't have negative impacts, such as rehospitalizations, which we know increases cost. The care coordinators that provide the Health Home Service is a way to bridge the system of care. This helps decrease the duplication of efforts and also identifies potential gaps in care that have addressed early can keep clients healthier for longer stretches of time. Next slide. So this is the health home structure. So CMS um, contracts with the health care authority and had a stipulation in the contract that we, they also partner with DSHS. So DSHS and health care authority in partnership lead, um, contract with lead organizations and then they contract, um, the lead organizations contract with the care coordination organizations. So lead organizations could be um, managed care plans and then also fee-for-service leads. Um, for example, you know, all of the managed care organizations are a lead, and then some of the fee-for-service leads are Community Choice, Pierce County ACH, which is now Elevate Health, and um, we also have a few area agencies on aging. And then they contract um, with care, coordina care coordination organizations, uh, for example, Compass Mental Health, pediatric clinics, uh, Catholic Community Services, CMAR, MultiCare, and then um, also some of the areas on aging are also um, care coordination organizations. Um, each lead establishes a network of care coordination organizations to bridge all service domains, including, as I said, medical, mental health, chemical dependency, and long-term services and supports. Um, a requirement of the program is a mandate for the leads to contract with care coordination organizations or CCOs um, that would include federally qualified health centers, HIV AIDS organizations, pediatric clinics, as I said, and other community-based medical or social service organizations. Um, some leads do also provide direct health home services. For example, the Northwest Regional Council and the Southwest Aging, on, uh, Southwest Aging and Long-Term Care are leads, but they also provide care coordination. Um, next slide. So we have seven health home coverage areas, as you can see. I believe this is also a handout. Is that correct? No? Okay. So it's not a handout, but if you would like it, at the end you can email us and we can get it to you, and it is also on the health home um, webpage. But it just shows, based on each area, who is contracted, um, the contracted leads, and then um, the CCOs would be underneath the leads. 
Okay, so next slide. So who is eligible for the Health Home Program? So they have to be enrolled either in Medicaid only or be dual eligible, which means they have Medicare and Medicaid. They have to have a PRISM risk score of a 1.5 or greater, and then we'll talk about what that is in just a moment. And they have to have one chronic condition um, as defined in um, the state plan amendment, and then be at risk for a second. All ages are eligible. Um, so all the way from pediatric to um, older, the uh, older population. So um, PRISM, the PRISM risk score is a um, is a web-based tool that the state uses to uh, predictive predict cost modeling. The algorithm in the PRISM takes into consideration the client's age, gender, diagnosis, and medications. It provides a perspective medical risk score that measures the expected healthcare cost over the 12 next the next 12 months based on the client's uh, healthcare claim history from the past 15 to 24 months. Um, if they do not have any claim history in Provider 1 or Medicare data, um, we do have a clinical eligibility tool that um, can be used, and we'll talk about that more in just a moment. Okay, so the next slide. So defining high uh, future risk medical, future medical cost risk. So, this was developed, the PRISM risk score was developed to identify um, it, clients where care coordination would most likely result in reducing future costs. It estimates the expected future medical costs relative to a comparison group and considers <clears throat> excuse me, a person's age, gender, diagnosis, and medical uh, medications, as I stated before, in the past 15 months for adults and 24 months for children. A client with a risk score of 1.0 means that their future medical um, costs are expected to be the same as the average medical cost for a person qualifying um, for Medicaid due to disability. Adult and children, um, a, adult and child risk ways are cl calibrated separately to the disabled adult and the disabled child populations retrospectively. A client with a risk score of 1.5 means that they are expected to incur 50% higher costs in the next year than the average cost for a Medicaid disabled client. Roughly 7% of all Medicaid clients have a risk score of 1.5 or above. For some groups, that percentage is higher, others lower, but on average, it's 7% of the population. Since care coordination resources are limited, a policy decision was made to target health homes and care coordination to the top 5%, 5 to 7% of the Medicaid population. And um, the score um, is only a standing point though. It, a client with, okay, so sorry about that. So, um, so a client with a score of 1.2 will generally be less complex than a client with a score of a 7.0. But the difference between 1.2 and 1.3 are likely to be um, different from a case management perspective. So we just start at this point. Um, we, if the um, is if the Medicaid client is identified as clinically qualified, they stay qualified regardless if their prison score drops below a point a 1.5. So the starting point for the health home program is when they're identified is the 1.5. They can go up or they can go down. Once they're actually in the health home program, if their risk score goes down, which is what we would like to see, um, they still are able to remain in the program as long as they choose. Okay, next slide. So talking, oh, go back one, please. Thanks, Lana. Um, so as, as we've talked about a little bit, we focus on the, the high-risk clients. They are the most uh, at risk for, health, for adverse health outcomes. They have the greatest ability to decrease hospitalization and um, institutional utilization, and they most likely need multiple Medicaid services. Um, this is cost-effective and does achieve a return on investment. Um, Many of the high-risk clients have extensive health challenges resulting from social determinants of health, such as homelessness, isolation, lack of transportation, and language or cultural barriers. Washington's previous experience with the chronic care management program, as well as national studies, support targeting the high-risk clients for intensive care coordination services. They have the best potential to improve their health and reduce costs, and they're much um, 
and they benefit from high-tech, community-based care organizations that the Health Home Services provides. Next slide. Next slide, Wanda. Oh, you have it, I'm sorry. Um, clients who are not eligible, some clients are unable to enroll in the program even if they meet criteria due to restrictions on how the health home program is administered. Because the health home program cannot duplicate pre-existing services, clients enrolled in care management programs through hospice or PACE, uh, which is the pro uh, are not enrolled are not enrolled into the health home program. Likewise, a PCCM enrollment prohibits participation in the program. Although the client can always opt out of his or her PCM at any time, they may want to consider this option if the PCCM enrollment is all that is keeping from the client being able to be eligible. Clients with other comparable health insurance plans, in addition to Medicaid, can also not enroll in the health home program. So if they have a Medicare Advantage plan, they are not eligible for the health home program because that is considered duplication of services because they should get care coordination services through that. And also if they have a, um, a primary insurance, a private insurance, or um, uh, third party liability. Okay, and next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Um, the, so the basics of the health home program so the health home services, which we do not want to be confused with home health, as that is um, a very confusing term because they're so much the same, are truly a new set of Medicaid benefits payable to care coordination organizations providing the services. Participation in the health home program is voluntary and it does not cost, there is no cost to the clients. Again, as I stated, they do not duplicate medical or other Medicaid provider services currently being delivered. Rather, care coordinators step in when a service is necessary by identifying gaps in care and helping close the gaps as needed. And the health home services are not always clinic-based. Clinic they um, include care coordinators who are community-based, meaning they know the resources in their community, um, they visit the client's home or at the location of the client's choice, and um, the, this is a unique aspect of the health home program. Um, and it ties home life to the client's health care. Um, and so this is really person-centered and it is really trying to meet the client where they're at and giving them the needs that they feel they need, not what you know you feel that they need. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Brandy now um, to talk about care coordinators and what that looks like. Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, Wanda, next slide, thank you. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about the services provided and uh, we'll start off with talking about who are these care coordinators, who is providing the service. So uh, health home care coordinators, they're qualified, so they have specific um, education or licensing credentials. They could be uh, nurses, social workers, mental health counselors, um, chemical dependency professionals, uh, you know, we there are a variety of uh, care coordinators, and care coordinators are employed by different uh, community-based organizations, as uh, Nicole was talking about earlier. So, you know, and, and there's a wide variety. So depending on what the client's needs are, they could be assigned many different, or to a different um, uh, care coordination organization. So, um, they could be, if they're pediatric, they might go to a pediatric clinic. If they're a, um, if, if maybe the, the focus is a mental health diagnosis, they might go to Compass Mental Health or Frontier. Um, if it's um, medically based, if, you know, some of their uh, diagnosis, then it could be, you know, their, their local um, health care provider, so who is contracted with, with a lead. These care coordinators also, um, so besides being qualified, they also uh, attend a two-day mandatory training before they can uh, do um, the work with the clients, the health action plan that we'll talk about in a, in a moment. So care coordinators are also excellent resources. So um, as Nicole just mentioned, they are community-based. And so they, they should know their community and what the client needs. 
they're also going to be providing services face to face in that client's home or uh, wherever the client chooses services to be provided. So, but they do go out and do home visits with the client monthly. So, um, and besides that, they're also an excellent resource for providers because they they not only partner with clients, with families, um, with providers. They also partner with other supports like case managers or others in the community to make sure those uh, coordination is done across the many different systems of care, which in turn hopefully will decrease duplication of efforts and identify any potential barriers. So, but they are really the boots on the ground that deliver the health home services. They actively work with their clients uh, to complete their goals and action steps and really support them in progressing toward um, the client meeting their goals. So, and they are available, they, besides doing the monthly um, home visits, they are available by telephone, um, it, you know, to providers as well as other support. So, now we're going to take a little closer look at the six health home services. So, next slide, Wanda. All right, so right here, this slide shows the six health home services. Um, we're going to go into a little bit of detail about each one in the next uh, couple slides. But, um, okay, yeah, we'll just do that now. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, comprehensive care management. So um, the program allows care coordinators to work, um, like I just mentioned, with families, with friends, with caregivers, with legal representatives, with providers that are both paid and unpaid, and bill for those services. So, um, and, and assist them with, with whatever they need. And they complete uh, required and additional screening, which we'll show here in a minute. Um, and really, kind of the primary role is to work with the client to develop this a health action plan, or we call them HAPs, and they update them at least every four months, um, sometimes more often, but they're always working on those health action plans, and we'll we'll look at an image of a, a HAP in, in a slide coming up. So, okay, next slide. Okay, so these are required assessment tools. So care coordinators will do each of these assessments um, at least every four months. Again, just like with a HAP, they could be done more often if needed. So the first one, the patient, the parent, or caregiver activation measure. Um, this is proprietary uh, tool from Insignia, and it uh, reliably measures activation and the behaviors that underlie activation. So um, client activation is the is, is having that knowledge, the skills, the emotional support, and the belief to self-manage one's health, to collaborate with providers, to maintain function, and to prevent decline, and access appropriate high-quality care. So when we're looking at activation, that's kind of, you know, what we're looking at. So people with higher scores with this tend to have better interaction with their providers. And those with lower scores may feel that they have little ability to um, affect their health or the provision of their own health care services. So we do this as a way of, um, you know, the person-centered approach where really getting to uh, know the care coordinator will know how best to work with the client, especially when developing goals and action steps um, because we want to develop goals and action steps that the client will achieve and, and feel successful in. And they're going to need different things. Some may feel more confident in being able to talk to their health care providers, while others may not even know questions to ask or, or may not feel very comfortable in speaking with providers. So care coordinators can do a lot, of, a lot with that. They can coach their, their clients or they can go to doctor appointments with them. They can help them write down um, questions to ask their doctor. So, you know, but really they're going to be looking at that activation measure as 
a way to kind of help, um, you know, figure out where the action steps and, and the goals are going to be. Um, they also do depression screening. They have the PHQ-9 for adults and the PSC-17 for our pediatric population. They do the CATS ADL, so which is an activity of daily living. It's a very um, brief screening tool, so it's only six uh, activities of daily living they're looking at. So if you're familiar with our uh, the Home and Community Services Care Tool, it's, it's nothing like that. It's just um, you know a way to look at those activities of daily living um, and see you know if they are independent or not, and if referrals need to be made. And let's see, and then they also do a BMI um, with the client. So, and I just also want to note that, um, of course, clients um, always have the right to decline any of these assessments. All right, next slide. All right, so these are additional assessment tools that the care coordinator may use, and um, if any of these are indicated, then the care coordinator um, is required to do these assessments. Uh, so, and they have the audit, the DAST, they have a falls risk screen, they have an anxiety uh, um, assessment, and pain scales. And they're, they have available different pain scales because there may be some clients who may not be able to express themselves, so they might choose to do one that um, maybe is based on observation or another one that's based on images of faces, so instead of the numeric scale. So, But all these are available, and again, the client has the right to decline any of these. So, All right, next slide. All right, so this I mentioned uh, just a, a moment ago is our is the image of the health action plan or the HAP, and it may look a little different. Like if um, if you're working with a care coordinator and and they show you the HAP, um, because all our lead organizations use different platforms, and so the HAP you know they they put the HAP into these platforms for the care coordinators to work on. Um, so it may look a little different printed up, but it has all the same information in it. So it has to have um, some brief demographic information. The screenings that we just went over, it has that. It has the goals and action steps will be on that, a little introduction. Um, so, But this really is kind of the, the center of the program and what the care coordinator is working with the client on. So this is a, something that the client writes with the assistance from the care coordinator. So you know, truly, it needs to be person-centered um, and identifies what the client wants to do to improve their wellness, um, their quality of life, and you know, I will say it doesn't have to be medically based. I mean, if you know, if they have some diagnosis, and that's why they're in the program. And of course, we're we're looking at a better management of their their health. Um, but maybe the client, you know, maybe they want to save up for a vacation, or they want to um, be able to go visit a park again. Um, those could be goals that that they're going to work on and put on here. Um, but we know as the client succeeds in in their goals. Um, and their action steps that that really does so much to improve their own um, wellness and quality of life. So, so the client, of course, agrees to work with the care coordinator to develop this. They identify at least one goal. Sometimes they have more. There's room on other pages of this uh, health action plan to develop many more goals. But you know, they ha they have to do at least one. Um, and actions are noted on this on who is going to be working on this on these goals. So if it's somebody outside the care coordinator and the client, the care coordinator should be coordinating that with um, case managers or whoever else, you know, providers or 
caregivers or family members, um, they'd be working with them to let them know. So, um, so really, you know, just to sum up, this HAP is person-centered. It's reviewed regularly. So every month, the care coordinator is is reviewing the goals and action steps. It's updated at least every four months and identifies really what the client wishes to do to improve their wellness. Um, and it could consist of health-related goals and non-health-related goals, including social determinants of health. All right, next slide. Okay, so back to talking about our services. So the next service, the first one was the comprehensive care management. Um, this next one is care coordination. And care coordination really is providing that an opportunity um, to support that and implement the health action plan after it's been developed. So care coordination involves working with the client um, in completing those action steps, supporting them in progressing toward um, and meeting their those goals, and also it provides effective communication between providers, both paid and unpaid providers, um, who may have a role in the client uh, achieving their health action goals. So uh, services, again, are provided through face-to-face -face, um, monthly visits, as well as, you know, through the telephone and any electronic contact. Um, so, and we'll talk about um, uh, community collaboration uh, coming up here soon, but, you know, community, any type of multidisciplinary care team is really important with, with any type of care coordination, and um, like I said, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Okay, next slide. Okay, health promotion, another service. So, um, providing wellness and prevention information too that are specific to those client the client's um, chronic conditions or other things that they'd like to know more about. Um, the care coordinator could act as a health coach in supporting the client in initiating and sustaining those behavior changes and providing educational materials so and other resources. So if they need to um, you know, call the doctor for a referral for a um, certified diabetes educator or a health coach or, or, or something, at, you know, along those lines. That's what they would be doing. So any type of health promotion. All right, next slide. Okay, comprehensive transitional care. And we'll look at this for a couple slides just because it's, it's really uh, uh, an important part of Services so comprehensive transitional care. Um, of course, the pre you know prevention. What we want to do is prevent avoidable readmission after discharge. Um, we also want to you know if we can um, you know work out whatever barriers that are in place um, that you know maybe the client's going to the emergency department very often. And we know that's a high utilizer client that, and why they get some of these risk scores, the prison risk score that Nicole talked about, was because they're utilizing maybe the emergency department um, many, many times. I mean, we've had we've had clients on this program that um, were averaging a hundred ED visits every month. Um, which of course they're going to have a huge prison score, and and so working with the uh, care coordinator to really kind of look at that, you know, what's going on? Do they not have a primary care physician? Um, do they have an anxiety? So maybe they don't know the difference between their anxiety and um, a cardiac issue, or whatever it may be. You know, um, the care coordinator is going to be working on with the client on on figuring out what those gaps in care are, what are those barriers, and working on that. Um, and, you know, one unique as aspect of the health home program related to transitional care is that it's not just used for leaving hospitals, um, leaving emergency departments, that type of thing, 
or even to lesser care from like a skilled nursing facility to, to home. Um, but really it's for all types of transitions. So, you know, there are many types of uh, examples of transitional care is applicable, such as client moving from maybe an in-home setting going into a residential facility or um, from one assisted living facility to another. Or, you know, I would even add for transitional care that um, maybe someone's going from being homeless to a shelter or maybe they're going from a shelter to an apartment, or I would even add um, pediatric care to adult care. I mean, those are all huge uh, transitions for our clients. So the care coordinator is going to be involved with that and provide you know, appropriate and timely follow-up care um, and, and making sure not again to duplicate services, what's already being done, but just coordinating to make sure things involved with transitions are being done. Okay, next slide. So how do they do that? They participate in multidisciplinary teams um, to work on those transitions, because like I said, again, we don't want to duplicate services, if, especially if someone's discharging from a hospital, there's a discharge planner. But, you know, to, to coordinate services and make sure things are done. Um, they ensure the client the parent or caregivers have received those discharge orders. They understand those discharge orders. Um, they provide re medication reconciliation. So we have a lot that are nurses that may be able to do that medication reconciliation. If they're not able to, if they're not qualified to do Medicaid or medication reconciliation, then they ensure that it's done. So they find someone whether it be a pharmacist, a nurse, a primary care physician to do that medication reconciliation. Um, and they ensure that follow-up appointments are scheduled and, um, you know, just follow along with that. And, and all our, our care coordinators receive um, notice of emergency department use in patient hospitalizations. They have EDI or pre-manage. Um, and they're also going to include all the supports that the client has and providers as needed. Okay, next slide. All right, individual and family support, another of the six services. So, um, you know, another great thing about this program is that, you know, care coordinators can work with, with support systems, with, with um, family, you know, kind of beyond that client. Um, in, in helping to manage that client's chronic uh, condition. And, you know, this, um, you know, is, is often the case when, you know, maybe there's a, a, a non-paid caregiver that's uh, under a lot of stress or burden. Um, the care coordinators can make referrals for them if needed. Um, if it's a child, um, the care coordinators can work with the families to help them to help support them in what they need um, in just you know managing um, everything. So they also discuss advanced directives that is required within the first year that they go over advanced directives with all their clients and they make referrals uh, like I mentioned as needed. All right, next slide. All right, um, referral, next slide is referral to community and social support services. And I don't see it up there yet, but um, there it is. So, so referrals will, so care coordinators are gonna identify any available community resources, like Nicole mentioned earlier, you know, these. These care coordinators are in communities. They know their resources, so um, they know their communities and they make referrals as needed. They help manage those referrals. So just you know, making a referral and, and not following up with that, um, they wouldn't do. They they will follow up with that. Um, and also, they uh, could provide assistance to obtain and maintain eligibility for services if needed. And again, they're not going to duplicate services, but they are going to assist, you know, if needed. So if the client needs 
help filling out applications, um, you know, when, going with the client to appointments, if the client chooses that, um, they can do that. So, all right, next slide. All right, now I mentioned earlier how um, community collaboration is important, and really it is essential. Um, for any type of care management and care coordination, especially with our high-risk, high-utilizer um, Medicaid population. So it is our goal to introduce ourselves um, to any community partner because we are all, you know, sometimes we all see the same clients, or the same Medicaid clients. So, um, so becoming with familiar with one another, who's in the community, uh, who's doing what is really important. So, um, but, you know, with care coordination, especially community-based care coordination, really seeks to identify one primary care coordinator that who can follow um, that client across all the different systems of, of care. So, you know, I will say that care coordinators, you know, in our sense, they're not authorizing services, they're not, um, it's, you know, like ones with DSHs, they're not doing that type of thing. They're, you know, making referrals, following up, um, talking with case managers, talking with maybe other care coordinators, um, other specialists in the community about, you know, those things that the client um, needs. And they also don't, you know, treat or counsel clients either. So even if they are, say, mental health counselors, um, they don't counsel, they don't treat um, in that sense. So they are care coordinators um, and help the client uh, work on those goals that they've identified. And um, so really, you know, Health Home shouldn't change the way the client's receiving services, and it shouldn't change any of the services that they're receiving, whether they're paid or unpaid. So really the work of care coordinators should complement that of others in that community. Um, and we've just listed some, you know, some here on this slide. So, but just showing that care coordinators can work with all providers to assist that client in reaching their health goals. Um, in any way. So really, you know, we're looking at um, this, you know, the role of the care coordinator to really complement, um, you know, others' role. All right, next slide. So we're going to go over, uh, we're going to share two stories about the Health Home Program. And so Nicole's going to start us off with one. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I am going to ta uh, talk about Bill, not his real name. Um, a, he is a 35-year-old male who opted into the health home program in the summer of 2016. Bill has extensive medical, uh, I'm sorry, mental health diagnoses, a polysubstance abuse history, developmental disabilities, and an extensive legal history, including felony convictions. Bill's medical history includes being caught in a fire which burned him from his toes to his navel. He was in a traffic accident that ejected him from a vehicle, breaking multiple bones and incurring a TBI, which is traumatic brain injury, torn ligaments, and detached muscles. Bill lives in a four-wall cabin in the distant mountains without any utility services. He has a history of frequent homelessness and does not have a driver's license or a bank account. In 2016, Bill was using the emergency room approximately 105 times a year. He had never had a primary care physician and frequently lost his benefits and coverage due to not completing requirement, required forms or missing meetings. Bill had unique care coordination needs and lived in a remote area. Over time, in working face-to-face -face with the client in that remote setting, the care coordinator was able to identify dyslexia as a communication barrier and was able to advocate for written and verbal communication with Bill's providers that works the best for Bill. The care coordinator also helped him initiate counseling for the first time for his polysubstance abuse, PTSD, and the history of burn and burn recovery. Also initiated inpatient substance abuse services and the care coordinator negotiated with the hospital to identify a primary care provider who would work with Bill. The care coordinator collaborated with providers and various agencies in working with Bill. Early in the program, all Bill's goals were crisis-oriented and based on unmet needs. 
Now Bill's goals include what he wants to do with a, as a career and how he can develop and improve his social skills. Another outcome measure is that his ER visits have been reduced from 105 per year to just 30 in the last 12 months. And in the last 61 days, he has not had any ER visits. So this is just a great story about the quality improvement and the cost effectiveness for the systems because going from 105 to, you know, 30 is a big deal and especially none in the last 60 days is, is big. So um, Brendy's going to tell one more story and then we'll move on. Yeah, thanks, Nicole. Yeah, that is a huge <laughs> improvement. But And it, it takes time. So, um, you know, that client's been on the program for a couple of years, but, you know, what a remarkable, um, you know, changes that, that he's gone through. So I'm going to talk about John. And so a care coordinator had sent us this uh, story, you know, while well, they send us all these stories, but... Um, so John's described by his care coordinator as a gentle, a quiet man in his 60s who loves his dogs, um, like his, like their family, and tries to help out whenever he can, whoever he can. Um, he signed up for the program in 2015. And since he started with the Health Home Program, John's completed treatment for uh, hepatitis C, is on a routine schedule of picking up and, and actually taking his medications as prescribed. Um, he's seeing a behavioral health counselor on a routine basis and has been housed by a, a respite housing program when he was too sick to be on the street. So John... Um, had been chronically homeless for 40 years, so the majority of his life. Um, he had multiple, he has multiple diagnoses, depression, COPD, he has chronic pain, hep C, like I mentioned, diver diverticulitis. Um, and during his time homeless, he stayed in different shelters, uh, stayed in different camps, and also had been living in a, a motor home that had no running water or heat. So in 2018, um, you know, this guy has been on services since 2015, but in 2018, what John wanted to work on was that he was finally ready to find some housing and get off the streets for good. So, uh, and, and that took took time getting to that point, I mean, building that relationship with, with John um, just to get to that point. But John and the care coordinator worked on applications, um, applied to many different housing apartments. Um, six weeks later, um, after many meetings, follow-up calls, um, the care coordinator found out John passed his background check, had an interview scheduled for an apartment. And um, with John's request, the care coordinator went with him to the interview for some uh, emotional support. So after that, uh, care coordinator got another call that John passed the interview and he moved into a, a studio apartment within a couple of days from that. So um, at the end, it moved very fast. but. Currently, you know, just getting housing, currently John is struggling with that transition from being homeless to having his own apartment for the first time in 40 years. So John, the care coordinator is saying, John, you know, tells them that he often feels like he didn't make the right decision in moving into an apartment. Um, and so John's story really highlights the realization um, that it's not just about finding someone housing who's been homeless, um, but it's also about knowing how to how to walk with someone as they move through the various transitions of their lives. So the care coordinator really didn't expect John's reaction to getting their own place. Um, and you know John's really trying to get used to living on his own in this in this different way. And so the goals now that they're working on, you know, in, still involved that transition, but um, kind of getting what what John needs to stay in that in that place and the support needed, you know. And and I really appreciate the care coordinator's um, honesty and and just um, 
you know, realization that, you know, yeah, it's not just about finding housing, it's, it's other support. And, they, and, you know, they admitted they didn't think of that ahead of time, that they thought, you know, housing was the issue. So, um, but afterwards, you know, looking at it from a different standpoint and going, okay, you know, this client needs other supports and, and moving with that. So, and, and flowing with that. So, you know, the goal might have been housing and there were action steps involved with housing, but now it's moved into, you know, supporting the clients there and, and, and what that needs and um, whether that be, you know, through the help of the dogs uh, or whatever. So, you know, a couple uh, different stories, but these are common stories that we have in the health home program. So now I'm going to, next slide, I'm going to send it back to Nicole. All right, thanks, Brendy. So um, there is multiple ways to see if um, the client is eligible uh, for the health home program. Um, I did talk about eligibility a little bit in the beginning. Um, they are automatically enrolled if they meet the eligibility and, um, requirements, and then um, the care coordinator or the care coordinator organization would reach out to them to try to get them engaged in the program. Um, and so there's multiple ways if you're, you think that you may have somebody that should qualify for the health home program. In just a bit, I'll show you if you do have access to provider one how to see if they're already enrolled. But another way um, to check, and we talked about this just a little bit, is to um, look at the clinical eligibility tool. And so the provider would be the one filling out this. And you can go at um, the online, it's right here, it's on the HCA um, website uh, for the health home program. And then you can just look up the clinical, clinical eligibility tool. Uh, next slide. So this is what it looks like, and again, this is just if you have somebody that you believe should be in the health home program, they may not have the um, PRISM risk score of a 1.5 or higher. Again, that's just based on claim data for the last um, 12 months. So um, these, are, these are ones that if they're just coming on to Medicaid or just becoming dual, or if they have moved here from a different state, or they just don't have that risk score because of the claim data, the provider can go in and do um, do this, and then they would just send it to the health home at HCA inbox, which I believe is on the next slide. So you can move to the next slide. Okay. So yeah, the health home mailbox, any questions you have regarding eligibility, you can definitely send it to this website. Um, just make sure to encrypt it. And um, if you know their provider one ID number or their date of birth, um, please add that in there. It will make it easier to be able to tell if they are eligible or um, what to do with the clinical eligibility tool. Next slide. Now we're not sure um, who on the line has access to provider one. If you don't, you can just email the health home inbox and they can tell you if the client is um, eligible or enrolled in the health home program. But if you do have access to provider one, you can go ahead and put in their Provider One ID number, and it should come up saying if they are enrolled in Health Home Program. It may not necessarily show if they are engaged. Um, the image here is um, a detailed view from a managed client enrollment screen. Um, first, the client with the image on the top, um, let's see, is showing that they're, I can't see it. There's a few. Oh, it's a fee-for-service, not a managed care one. So fee-for-service would either mean that they're AIAN or that they are Medicare or Medicaid. So they would be fee-for-service, so they would make sure that they have a fee-for-service lead. And then if they're just Medicaid only, then they would be in a managed care organization. Um, and so it would show that there. Um, so um, let's see. Um, we have provided in some of the documents um, contact lists for the leads. So um, if you see on here that they do have a health home, you can see that it says health home and then what the lead organization is. You can also contact them, but if it's easier, you can just email the health home inbox too. Okay, next slide. Now, if you do have access to provider one, but you can only look up eligibility, this is what it would look like. Um, it would have the plan name, and in this case, it's full life care, health home only as an example, with the behavioral health service organization as Molina. 
Under the health home eligibility, it shows the start date, and as long as those dates are current, then the client is enrolled. Again, this won't necessarily show that they're engaged, and so you could either contact the lead entity or, again, email the health home inbox. Okay, next slide. So um, this is a very small image, so you probably can't even read it, but again, this is the contact information for all the lead organizations in which region that they're in. This is in um, the documents provided that you can print up or save to your computer so you have on hand. And um, if you don't do that or you need information later, you can always contact Brenda or I or the Health Home Inbox. Um, next slide. So in closing, the care coordinators um, really do provide the bridge between the client and all the other client, client system. It's just non-clinical, clinical support, food, housing, legal, uh, transportation, and um, this program has been proven to be successful and actually work. And so, um, next slide. So this is some of the health home resources. Again, the HCA website has health homes. The DSHS um, website also has health home information. And then the health homes at the HCA inbox again. And um, I believe you, do they have a copy of the slides? Yeah, okay. All right, so you do, you do also have a copy of the slides that you can print out or save to your computer to have this information later on. And then um, the last slide, please. All right, so here's our contact information here at DSHS. If you have any questions, you can always um, email us, call us, and we really appreciate you letting us talk to you about the program today. We're super proud and passionate about this program and um, what it's doing for that marginalized population. And um, thank you. So unless, Brenda, you have anything else you want to say? No, I mean, we can take any questions, Wanda, if there's any questions. but. Um, just to let you know what we, the handouts that you have, so you should have a PDF version of the PowerPoint. Um, the contact list that Nicole just went over for the leads. Um, there's also a rack card. It's just an image of our rack card. So one side is for providers, the other is clients. So that's, you know, put out at different clinics and in agencies. And then also um, the uh, fact sheet. So if you, you know, had any other questions, you can also look at the fact sheet. But definitely feel free to to contact us um, if needed, as well as, you know, you can put questions into the uh, Health Homes mailbox through Healthcare Authority. And and that's it. Thanks again so much for, um, for your time and listening to us. Like Nicole said, we're very passionate about this program. And um, it has uh, you know, changed a lot of, of clients' lives, but also saved the state a lot of money as well and shared savings. So um, it is a, a fabulous um, program. So, all right. So, uh, uh -huh. there are, this is Wanda. There are a few questions here in the question box. Um, Wes asked, does the care coordinator receive motivational interviewing trauma-informed training and other related trainings? Okay, so, and with training, so, um, and I'll talk about motivational interviewing in just a second, but for training, you know, of course, care coordinators have to go through a two-day um, mandatory training, which we do talk a lot about MI. It's not a specific motivational interviewing training, but uh, a lot of the spirit of MI is, is woven throughout the entire uh, two-day training. They also um, have some required webinars that they're required to do in the first six months of um, their hire. And then we have available a monthly uh, webinar, sort of like this, um, and it's open to absolutely anyone in the entire state. I mean, I, you know, I open my webinars to, so anyone can listen in. You all are are available to listen in, um, but we have a monthly webinar on the second Thursday of every month at 9 a.m., and we go over various topics, So, and one that I'm working on in the future is is uh, kind of MI exercises. It's kind of hard to do in, in a short webinar um, version, but 
you know, we have different topics. We, um, like we're doing one in January on SMART goals. Um, for October, our webinars on uh, dementia, and we'll do some sometimes on different um, of the six services. We had one in June that was really fantastic on health promotion, um, but and sometimes they're on different uh, um, state programs. So you know, we did one. We had um, foundational community supports uh, actually provided our webinar last month, which was really fantastic, and and the care coordinators really appreciated hearing about that program that's available um, you know, with clients and, and how best they may be able to communicate with, with those providers. But a lot of our leads um, also sponsor various trainings, and they may sponsor an MI training for their care coordinator organizations and, and open it up to the community. So while, you know, we, we don't have, like we haven't, required care coordinators go to MI training. Many of them have already taken MI uh, training at some point. Or um, sometimes, like I said, a lead will sponsor um, that training and, and they'll do that. Um, because, you know, we really, you know, the person-centeredness and the MI, the spirit of MI is, is really important in this program. So we, we do try and, and get that information out there. So. Hopefully that answered the question. So, all right. Another question is: supported housing involved possibly a PACT team? Supportive housing involving a what? Or the PACT team? The PACT team. Mm -hmm. um, it, so, what's the specific question? Um, is supported housing involved at all, and possibly a PACT team? That's that's all I got. Okay. Well, you know, and like I had um, mentioned with that co community collaboration slide, I think it's really important and we really try to encourage care coordinators to to get to know um, who's in their community and who may be working with clients because often a lot of times there's multiple, you know, providers or programs or agencies working with our clients and we don't even know that. So, um, you know, and sometimes the clients don't really understand or know the differences between different people that that's working with them. So, you know, we really try and encourage care coordinators to kind of work through that, figure that out. Of course, it's all with client permission, though, that they contact others to talk with them. Um, um, but definitely, you know, we encourage uh, that and I, I would say that's essential when, especially when working with our our high risk, high utilizer Medicaid population. I think it's essential to work with one another. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I wanted to point out that the, there are handouts that can be downloaded in the GoToWebinar software. Um, also, Jefferson Spring asked, can you provide the region map as a separate document? Yes, we can send that to you, Wanda. Um, I don't. I, the current one also may be on the HCA website, but for health homes. But um, but definitely, we'll send you. We'll send you that. Some of the documents on the Healthcare Authority website are a little hard to find at the moment. <laughs> um, so yeah, we'll just send that off. No problem. Great, thank you. And then uh, Lisa says, "Is it possible to get a recording of this webinar and the slides?" to share with her coworkers. Um, she works on a flexible, assertive community treatment team in Lewis County. Okay. Um, yeah, Lisa, this uh, was supposed to be recorded. It said it was recording from the start. So uh, we'll be sending that link out a little later. Um, and then some people said this is so helpful and thank you so much. And then let's see, you mentioned hospice clients are not eligible for health homes. If a client were already enrolled in health homes and later went to hospice care, do they remain eligible for health homes? Yes, and and we can answer that. So, 
Yeah, and sometimes that can get a little confusing, but um, yes, if somebody's already on in the health home program and then uh, they get on hospice later, yes, they can can still remain in the health home program. So, um, and even if there were questions initially, um, you know, I, they can always, you know, um, care coordinators, community providers, anyone can, you know, always contact us to. Uh, to make sure there's no disruption. But, you know, that's another great thing I wanted to mention about the health home program is, you know, once a client is eligible and um, they can be on the program as long as they want, there's no, you know, even if that PRISM risk score drops below 1.5, as long as they maintain that Medicaid eligibility, so as long as they're still Medicaid eligible, they can be on the health home program as long as they choose to be. So, um, you know, and, and I, I think, you know, definitely with clients that are going on to hospice, you know, later time, I mean, that's another transition um, that's important. Uh, the care coordinator would just, you know, um, make sure that there's no duplication of efforts so they wouldn't be working on the same things that maybe the hospice social worker uh, is working on. They wouldn't be duplicating those type of efforts. But, yes, yeah, thanks for asking about that. Um, distinction between persons that are on the program first and then uh, go on hospice versus those that are already on hospice. All right, we got a couple more thank yous for doing this uh, from some folks online. All right, Great. that's all I see for questions. Um, again, these uh, the handouts, the PowerPoint, and the link will be sent out later today or tomorrow. Um, and thank you, Brendy, and thank you, Nicole. We really appreciate the information you shared. It's great that there's a program like this. I can't imagine the number of releases of information these folks have to go through, but... <laughs> uh, no, one other you. person asked, does a advance directive have to be asked yearly so if somebody has a advanced directive do they have to be asked yearly you know as far as have to no. I mean it, it does need to be within the first year but I would say for those clients um, that may need it uh, you know definitely we always you know best practice would be you know revisiting um, that information with the client as needed so but in the contract it just states within the first year all right well thank you again ladies it was a pleasure and uh, this is very helpful information we're going to end the webinar now and wish you all a great day thank, thank you. you for having us yes thank you